starting out, who are some players that you're higher on than maybe the the rest of the experts in, in the field? Are there certain guys that you're kind of planting your flag on that you're higher on? Yeah, it's, uh, we're looking at guys that are going earlier that I think I'm a little bit high on. Trey Young is definitely one of them. He kind of slipped a little bit last season, had some issues with his field goal percentage. Turnovers are obviously going to be there. But I think with Quinn Snyder there, kind of rejuvenating the offense is pretty much the polar opposite of what Nate McMillan was running in Atlanta there. So I think Trey Young's going to be able to have not only just a better overall season, but definitely going to shoot some more threes. Uh, he's going kind of middle of the second round in Yahoo leagues, most leagues. I'd probably have him as like a late first rounder, maybe first pick of the second round. So just a tad higher on him there. Another guy I really like that's kind of going later is Andrew Wiggins. Uh, his Yahoo ADP is kind of in the 90s, but I have no problem taking him in the 70s even. He was incredible to start last season. First month of the season, he was a top 25 player in fantasy basketball. And then he missed large stretch games because of an injury turned into an illness. And then he played a little bit, wasn't the same, and then missed the last two months of the regular season due to personal issues. Um, wasn't quite the same in the playoffs, but I'm expecting him to get back to what he was at the beginning of last season, heading into this year. So that's that's two guys that I'm pretty much coming away with in every single draft. And who are some guys that you're lower on uh, at their cost? Maybe guys that you're avoiding? Ooh, I mean, obviously, a lot of the injury-prone guys are quote-unquote injury-prone guys. Nobody can actually predict it, these injuries, but... A guy like Kevin Durant going in the first round or if Anthony Davis don't really want to spend my first round pick on a guy that might play 50 games. I want a guy that's going to play closer to 70. Second round, no problem getting them, but probably even as good as they are when they're on the court, not really looking to spend my first pick on them. Another guy is Chris Paul. I think I just, you know, it seems like he's going to be able to adjust his game a little bit to fit with Golden State. A lot of guys there, good coaching staff. So not surprised if they make it work out, but I think he's got to sacrifice a lot for it to work. So I'm not sure how well it works for fantasy. And then the Austin Reeves hype train, it's just a little bit too high for me. Everybody seems to be all in on him. I think he's a very good player. He's going to have a really good season, but for fantasy basketball, he's not really doing much defensively. He was already incredibly efficient for a younger guard. I don't see the numbers jumping up enough to grab him where I've seen him going around 75 range at times, sometimes in the 80s. I think he's more of a late 90s kind of guy in my book. Yeah, it feels like a lot of people are predicting an Austin Reeves breakout. Who are some guys that are younger that you could see breaking out and maybe, you know, this time next year, we're talking about them as being some of the biggest surprises of the season. Are there any guys that you can kind of project to break out? Uh, off the top of my head, the first one that comes to mind is a guy like Jalen Johnson, who it seems like we, we've seen him get a few starts during the preseason. And he's going to play a larger role in Atlanta after being in the G League during his rookie season and a kind of a smaller role off the bench last year. It seems like he's going to be fighting for the starting job. I don't imagine that he will start this season, at least to start the year. I think that'll be DeAndre Hunter and Sadiq Bey in the front court. But I think by this time next year, he's going to be a starter. They like that he's a playmaking four that's incredibly athletic. He's shown the ability to knock down shots from deep. He's kind of everything that they wanted John Collins to be, but also he can dribble and play make a little bit. So I think he fits really well alongside Trey Young and DeShante Murray. And he has a fantasy-friendly game because he can get defensive stats. He's going to shoot a pretty high percentage um, for a guy that's also has the ball in his hands. So I think he's the main guy that I can really think of that I think is going to be much better uh, coming into next season. You mentioned preseason action. How much are you evaluating preseason and taking stock in what you're seeing? And how much are you just kind of sticking to your opinions? I guess like, you know, watching some of these preseason games, there's guys putting up crazy numbers. How do you, how much do you have that sway your opinions or do you try not to let it influence your rankings too much? I think I don't let it impact. It's kind of a case by case basis for me. Obviously there's going to be guys that have massive games, specifically young guys that have massive games while they're kind of managing the minutes of some of their more experienced players. Um, you, we've seen Pey Peyton Pritchard have some really good games for Boston, but we know he's not going to be a major part of their rotation this season. Uh, so a guy like that, you know, it's nice to see it from a dynasty perspective because maybe one day he can be able to produce, maybe not to that level, but provide some solid production, especially in deeper leagues. But I think it's important to see how coaches use players. Um, I just, I keep going back to Atlanta, but it's, it's easy for me because I'm watching all the games, but uh a guy like Jalen Johnson saying, okay, like they're comfortable putting him in the starting unit. Okay, 
Quinn Snyder wants click up, or excuse me, Nyeka Kongwu shooting some outside shots. They like those guys long term. So I think it's more important from a dynasty perspective, kind of seeing how coaches like players and seeing things that they want to see them try. And seeing just how rookies adjust to the game, we've seen Brandon Miller play much better than he did during summer league, which is encouraging for him. I think he's a great guy to take a, a shot on in the last couple rounds um, that can end up providing some really good value, uh, probably more later in the season. But as far as you know, random seven or eight year veterans that are breaking out and having these having big games, not really putting too much stock in that because you know it's got to change come opening night. I'm curious, uh, we've seen fantasy football as, you know, blown up and, and obviously uh, tons of people play it, uh, you know, even with like DFS, prize picks, you see tons of talk about football. Fantasy basketball has always had a harder time kind of winning fans over just because you have to check it daily. Uh, I, I think with prize picks, we've seen in, in some daily fantasy, there's more interest in it. But as far as like a season long fantasy basketball league, that, that really hasn't taken off in popularity. You know, do you think there's anything, I know sleepers tried a few things like, uh, having a, you pick one game per week and you can lock that game in. And that's how, you know, you can kind of allow fans to not have to check every single day and set their lineup every single day. Uh, or they, you know, there, there's a lot of different things people have tried, but what do you think fantasy basketball can do to kind of challenge fantasy football or become more popular? I'm not sure if it'll ever be as popular as fantasy football because, you know, all the games are condensed into tiny part of the week and the so you know football football's so popular but is there anything that fantasy basketball can do on that front to kind of get more popular or more mainstream yeah i think that there's things that can be done i think a lot of it is you know if you go into a random business no matter where they are a lot of the staff are just going to say hey do you guys want to do a fantasy football league this year but you don't really hear about people doing oh my work fantasy basketball league so i think that's part of the reason fantasy football is pop more popular especially also just you can see ratings with the NFL versus the NBA. But I think, you know, it, it's funny. The reason that you mentioned is that people say, oh, I don't want to have to check my lineup every day. But we know fantasy football people are also checking their lineup every day. I check my every single day for fantasy football as well. So it's like I'm True. consistently looking to see who's available, what moves have been made, uh, keeping up with news updates. So I think that's, you know, I don't think it takes but 10 minutes if you're doing a couple fantasy basketball leagues to set your lineup every single day. But I think it's also, it's just a, a more complex game to play. I mean, fantasy football, it's, you're looking at points and there is points leagues in fantasy basketball, but I think category leagues is kind of where you're really looking at uh, where the hardcore players are playing. It's, you know, and then you're accounting for a lot more strategy involved there. So I think it's more complex, which might also scare people away. But one thing that I've found that's made it easier for me, and I think also just people that may not be wanting to set a lineup every day, like you said, is you can settle, like make it weekly lineups in the NBA. You have to account for, you know, okay, this player's playing four games versus this player's playing three games. And sometimes that ends up, you know, influencing your decision, but it makes it so you don't have to check it every single day if you don't want to. Now you're going to end up checking it every single day, but I have that set for a few of my leagues so that it's not something that, you know, if I have a busy day, I'm stressing about, okay, I didn't set my lineup uh, for whatever league. So I think that's something that makes it a little bit easier, but really I think it's, it boils down to more that not as many people know about how fun it could be in fantasy basketball, just because not as many people do it. I was actually talking with uh, Robin Marks who runs a fantasy basketball podcast for believe in sports um, about, and this is me kind of sharing my idea. So hopefully either somebody takes it or, and runs with it because that'd be cool. But um, is if you, play NBA 2K and you see uh, like the social media page on your, on your league or your, my career, it has different uh, reporters or analysts talking about games from last night. And I think it'd be really cool to get some fantasy basketball analysts. I'm not, I'm not just trying to get my name in 2K. Like if it's other people like, cool, like I, I'm more for this happening. And then you're playing in your, your, my league on 2K or your, my career. And, you know, Josh Lloyd said, wow, like this, player had this many points, rebounds, assists, steals, blocks, definitely going to add him uh, on the waiver wire next week. And it just has that there. It's like, oh, okay. Like fantasy basketball is in my mind. I think that just helps. It's more of about reaching different people. I personally, what sleeper does with the game pick, I don't love because then I have to make a decision on, oh, is this player going to actually do better in this game versus like, is the matchup? I don't know. Not something that I personally love, but I think weekly lineups and just exposure are two things that could really help. 
No, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm curious, when you're trying to approach a draft that's a nine category league versus a draft in a points league, what are some of the biggest differences as far as your draft strategy and maybe tips for, for viewers that either have both side of leagues or they're only in one and they're trying to figure out how to parse their rankings and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so obviously, you know, standard nine category is points, rebounds, assists, steals, blocks, turnovers, field goal percentage, threes made, free throw percentage. I think that's the nine. And then points leagues, it could be anything. I think the pretty standard is one point for points, 1.2 for rebounds, 1.5 for assists, three for steals, three for blocks, minus one for turnovers. So it's just really looking at the difference. That's the standard, but I know like if you go on an ESPN points leagues, they give you minus one for a field goal attempt and plus one for a field goal made. So it ends up being kind of weird and hard to uh, keep track of. But just looking at those standard ones, when you're playing in a points league, you don't have to worry about percentages. So a guy like a Russell Westbrook that's going to have a low field goal percentage, as it's a little bit better with the Clippers, a low free throw percentage, but it's going to get you a decent amount of points, rebounds, and assists. He's got a lot more value in points leagues than he does in category leagues. John Morant kind of fits that same structure of a guy that is going to be better in points leagues than category leagues. So they end up going a little bit higher. Guys like RJ Barrett, Kelton Johnson, uh, that don't really give you any other stats other than points are able to be, you know, probably top 100, borderline top 100 guys in points leagues, whereas the category leagues, you might take them in the last two rounds. Uh, with category leagues, like I mentioned earlier, a lot more strategy goes into it because you can choose to punt categories and say, I'm just not going to worry about field goal percentage and turnovers. That's one of my favorite things to do is say, I don't care about field goal percentage, don't care about turnovers. I'm going to try and win the seven other categories and I'm going to start my draft with LaMelo Ball and Trey Young. That's my favorite thing to do this year because they're going to take my field goal percentage. They're going to take my turnovers, but they're going to give me a ton of points, ton of assists, ton of threes. So just going in with certain strategies like that and kind of deciding based on probably who you get in the first couple of rounds, how the rest of your draft is going to look. It's an important thing to consider because if you, if you start your draft with Giannis and say, okay, I'm going to punt free throws, not worry about them, punt threes, not worry about them. I can go Demonis Sabonis the next round. He's going to give me like, you know, uh, let me see. I could probably actually tell you exactly how many threes he hit per game last year. 0.4. So not much. Free throw percentage isn't great. And then you go Zion round five, that maximizes his value as well. So it, it can end up changing the value of the players a lot by each manager, which makes it pretty interesting because a guy like Zion is going in around pick 60, but if you're pairing him with Giannis and Sabonis and he stays on the court. It's a pretty hard team to beat because you're going to dominate about five categories. So a lot more strategy goes into your nine category leagues as opposed to your points leagues. Cause then it's like, I don't care if it's points, rebounds, assists or what, Points are points. I love Julius Randle. I love Pascal Siakam. Guys like that that are going to be dominant in points leagues. They're still good in category leagues, but they don't quite reach that same level of production. For sure. One thing that I did last year was I joined my first dynasty basketball league, and that's been so much fun being able to add different rookies. And, you know, I just love the strategy and that too. I basically went and loaded up with a super young team, but other people added a bunch of veterans and they're in win now mode and have, you know, a one or two year championship window. So I love Dynasty. I would recommend it to anyone that's a big diehard basketball fan. I think it's so much fun. And, you know, it makes it more fun when you're watching the draft and actually scouting these rookies to, you know, draft your team each year. Uh, I think it's a ton of fun. So what advice would you have for someone that's maybe entering a Dynasty League and has a startup draft? You know, do you typically go for, young high upside guys are you more of a win now approach like what's your dynasty strategy usually that that probably depends on who i'm playing with if i'm playing with friends that i know are going to be committed and i'm saying okay guys we're going to do this for the next 40 years or whatever obviously we haven't gotten to that point so i have no idea if it's actually gonna last that long but it's been lasting a few years so it's like okay i'm cool to start young rebuild tank because i know it's at least going to go five years and be able to see this rebuild through I personally have a lot of fun uh, tanking within the rules because it depends on your league, uh, how much they allow. And just starting young, you know, watching a second round pick that I made crack a rotation and say, wow, like, you know, they have some upside. I personally enjoy that. Um, but I think if I'm going into a league with people I don't necessarily know, I'm probably going to go more win now. But it really depends on what pick I get. If I have the number one pick, I'm probably going to go Jokic, go more win now. If I have 
pick three, I'm probably going to end up with Victor Wembanyama. Might do a little bit of a rebuild because of how young he is. So I kind of see who's the best player available in the first round and let that dictate how I go with the rest of my draft. But it's also possible to go kind of young and still compete early on because some guys that are older might not be drafted very high. I think, you know, a guy like LeBron is going to go significantly later in dynasty leagues than he will in redraft. So you can still go young the first couple of rounds and then get guys that are still producing that are just older in the later rounds because you're going probably about 300 players deep in a dynasty draft. So there's plenty of times to get older guys that can still produce later on and just have fun with it. I think you can kind of do both. Yeah, some of the most fun years I've had in fantasy football and fantasy basketball and dynasty leagues are the years where you are tanking or rebuilding and you're mm-hmm. selling off your veterans for future picks. You're developing young guys. It can be a ton of fun whenever, you know, you basically have a whole rebuild that you're you're working on. Um, that's one of the cool things about Dynasty 2. Even if your team sucks, <laughs> there are still fun <laughs> things that you can do as the season winds down because you're focused on the future and trying to stockpile. You basically get your Sam Presti on trying to stockpile young players and picks. Uh, so I've, I've loved Dynasty. Um, I want your thoughts on this tier's rookie class because, you know, you look at, obviously, all the talk is about Victor Wipanyama, Scoot Henderson, you know, looks fantastic and and could be very special player. The Thompson twins, Brandon Miller, there's, and, and even the depth, too. You start looking at some of the players, you know, in the, the teens. Uh, there are some, you know, really talented guys. What are your thoughts on this class as a whole? And then, you know, from a Dynasty perspective or even from a redraft perspective, I've noticed that, in redraft, rookies tend to fall later because, you know, people aren't sure what to expect from them or they really haven't done their homework as much on the rookies. Uh, what are your thoughts on the class as a whole? Yeah, it's a generational class. It's going to be a fun one that's really good for a really long time. A lot of the guys that I liked didn't get or didn't land in the best spots. So they might not produce a ton this year. I'm not really targeting them in redraft, such as a guy like Casey Wallace. I'm not really looking for him, even though I really liked him uh, coming into this year's draft. But I don't think he's going to get a ton of opportunities with the Thunder as a rookie. But you look at Wemby, generational guy, a guy you're probably going to take in the second or third round in redraft. Scoot Henderson, you can probably get around pick 100. Same thing with the Sar Thompson. Uh, it seems like Bilal Kulabali is going to start as well in Washington based on the preseason. We'll see if things change, but I think he provides them with a lot of defensive production. So him and Derek Lively are two other rookies that it looks like they can start. A lot of these rookies are going to come off the bench, but it seems like we have... Five or six are going to get a chance to start when you look at the top three picks, Asar Thompson, Lively, and Koulibaly. But then Ahmed Thompson looks phenomenal, a guy that they're going to struggle to not start. It's going to be a tough decision in Houston. They have a lot of depth, a lot of talent there. So a guy like Anthony Black's going to be probably stuck on Orlando's bench this year, but he has so much upside to provide steals. Um, Jairus Walker's probably going to come off the bench, but who knows, he could take over for Obi Toppin. So there's a lot of guys I like. Um, for fantasy, Keontae George could end up playing a good bit for Utah this season just because they don't have a point guard and are probably going to experiment with a lot of different things. It's a really good class. It's a very deep class. We've even seen Julian Strother who went with pick 29. I think he's had at least 20 points in every preseason game or maybe he had less than 20 in, in one game, but he's been phenomenal for Denver. So really good class from top to bottom. I think a lot of these guys are going to end up seeing minutes this year, even if only a a handful of them actually start. 